Good day and welcome to the Strong Ambition Podcast. I'm your host, Ryland Qualley. This is where we pick apart the people who have strong ambition and want to understand the mindset that it takes to be successful, pushing that strong ambition forward. And I have a wonderful guest that actually understands that to a T, and that is Jason Brooks. Jason Brooks is a rock star when it comes to mindset. He is a sports performance psychologist and he understands so well the internal thoughts we have and the practices that we need to utilize in order to improve our performance for life, for sport, for anything that you really need your mind in it. Okay, so without further ado, here is Jason Brooks. Hey Jay, how you doing man? I'm good man, it's good to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Well, I, I always appreciate your time. It's uh, it's incredibly valuable because all your knowledge you got to offer us. So, um, you know, I, I had a rough little introduction uh, prior, but uh, why don't you, uh, I, I actually don't know your history super well. Uh, I just met you through United Boxing and stuff like that. But why don't you start off with that? Like, uh, tell us a little bit about your stuff, yourself. Well, born and raised in, in Winnipeg, uh, spent all my childhood, mostly in East Kildonan, I would say. Um, two brothers, uh, one uh, half brother. I mean, I don't consider him a half brother, but uh, my parents separated when I was quite young. Um, so I was very fortunate to have, you know, double families, if you will. I had great families on both sides. Uh, my mom and dad both found new partners that they uh, married and, and spent their lives with. So I uh, had a great upbringing, uh, good brothers to do with, uh, do things with. My dad was the one who, who sort of really pushed me towards sports at an early age, um, which I think is a big part of it. If you want to do the sort of the working backwards from where you are now, the origin story, you know, what are some of the things that, that have shaped you? I think that was probably one of the biggest early influences was just my involvement in sport, uh, which is funny because it, it happened more out of necessity. Um, so again, I mentioned that, you know, when my parents had split up, um, and we were sort of half time between each of the two households. My dad was a, an elite level wrestling coach. And so we would invariably be spending our weekends with him every darn weekend. We were at a wrestling tournament somewhere. So without, you know, with him having, you know, custody of us in those days, he's having to half coach and then half wondering, you know, where the hell are my two sons and, and what type of trouble are they up to? So he just decided one night, I'll never forget it. I can't even remember how old I was. It was young, six maybe. Uh, I was starting to wrestle. He, he taught me two moves the night before, and he put me in a tournament just because it would be less cognitive load for him. At least he knew that, you know, I was going to be uh, doing something that was structured in the day. Um, so that was sort of my first uh, exposure to, you know, really organized sport. I, I dabbled in hockey, but it really wasn't my thing. Um, and then later in life, you know, football and a few other sports. But I think, you know, that was really what started it because I had great experiences in sport, um, but I was not ever the most talented kid. You know, I was good to above average athlete. And, and I, I think as I went on both in wrestling and in football, um, I realized that, you know, my skill alone wasn't going to get me, you know, to the to the level that I was hoping for, uh, or let alone just to be able to optimize my own potential. And so it kind of, again, out of necessity, I started to get curious at looking at, you know, biographies of people that I admired, athletes that, you know, had accomplished great things or, or had come back, you know, from tremendous odds or, or incredible instances of adversity and that sort of thing. So the more I started to delve into those kinds of topics and those types of life stories, I was slowly opening myself up to, you know, the literature and, and the general field in and around performance psychology, you know, personal development and that sort of thing. So, but I think all of that can be traced to uh, a panicked dad needing to put his kid in a sport. <laughs> that's, uh, that's kind of interesting how that fell together, right? Like, I mean, uh, just... And I mean, when you really look back, and, and I'm willing to bet you've probably had this discussion with athletes, is when you find out where the influences are, sometimes these random moments, these unpredictable, like you would never thought of it. And it's like, hey, just play. And uh, I still, that reminds me of the first day I got asked to play goalie. And it was just, you know, the coaches got to... Um, 
you know, upset. And we were young. We were like in like novice hockey or maybe Adam. And uh, one goalie kept like trying to get other people to try it out so he could try player. And eventually they just asked me, do you want to be our goalie full time? You know, that one decision seemed so simple as a goalie, as a kid. And that wrapped me around all the social relationships, all the psychology around that sport. Like that one decision makes all the impact and it's that butterfly effect for the rest of your life, you know? Totally. So um, that's, a, that's a really cool influence. So you, you are, you know, growing up with that kind of a, a dad who's, you know, into wrestling and stuff. So he was very competitive and had you in that kind of competitive mindset. Like, did you take a competitive mindset or did you just enjoy the competition? Like, where were you on that spectrum? Yeah, I, I, I certainly was competitive. I don't think I was obsessive in that way. I, I enjoyed competing and, and striving and trust me, I wanted to win. Um, in whatever whatever I did. Um, and my dad was very level-headed as far as that. I mean, again, it, it sounds cliche, but in all honesty, he was much more about, you know, the, the tangible things, the effort, the attitude, you know, this, this, the, the consistency. And if you commit to a team or commit to a sport, you know, you would expect that you're going to give it your all. Um, whether we won or not, it was never as important as sort of honoring the process and honoring the opportunity. You know, I was fortunate to be able to be involved in organized sports, and I never took that for granted. Um, so I had tremendous support. I will say this, though. It's funny. My, my dad also provided me uh, many great stories, obviously, any, any person's dad. But um, one that I always like to share with athletes, especially younger athletes, in terms of communicating with their parents, right? If you have a parent that, you know, is wanting to support their child, sometimes we, we have the best intentions, but maybe it's our the way it comes out can be a little bit, leave a little bit to be desired. Uh, and so my dad, God bless him. He was the loudest dad in the stands, particularly at my football games. Um, and I think that he felt that that was him demonstrating, you know, that of all the parents, he's trying to be even the most supportive of that. And, and most importantly, wanting me to know, you know, how, how much he was uh, encouraging and supporting me. Whereas the effect it had on me, I was pretty self-conscious about it. <laughs> you know, there'd be times where you wish he would just shut up. Or I remember in high school playing football, uh, the very first game I played quarterback, the very first game I played quarterback, uh, my dad couldn't contain his excitement. So he started the game. First quarter, he was in the stands with everybody else. Second quarter, he had kind of migrated towards the end zone. And I'll never forget, at some point in the game, when I came to the sidelines to talk to my coach, my dad was there. <laughs> I just thought, yeah, we're going to have a chat. But anyways, the, the lesson there is, you know, coach your parents up. You know, if there's a better way that they can support you, let them know. And that doesn't just extend itself to parents. Anybody who is important to you in your life, the relationship with your spouse or partner or what have you, you know, if you're pursuing something and you need to put a lot of time and effort into it, don't assume that they know what you need. Tell them how best to help you and they will. So the lesson there, I wish I could have gone back and said to my dad, you know, I appreciate the boisterous support you uh, provide me, but you know, it would be even more helpful to me, uh, dial it down to about level six, you know, but, uh, but no, all in all, I had tremendous support and he was, um, and it was, it was, how she say it? It's the classic, my dad was the wrestling coach and I'm one of his athletes. And so we did get treated you know, not lesser than, but but there would be no one who could ever accuse us of, of getting any type of favoritism. Let's just put it that way. Um, and so, again, it I think it fostered a little bit of grittiness. I think it fostered a little bit of, you know, nothing comes for, for nothing. You know, you're going to have to work for it. And those are all skills that are helpful, obviously. Yeah, that's that's the really positive framework of like you had said the idea of having and I still agree like the discussion with those parents is uh is always important to have I think you should have a healthy relationship my I'd say my experience is very much the opposite my parents were always there always supportive but supportive and not necessarily pushing in, in which I kind of liked like it was very much then not for an intense competition but just you know they could see I was passionate about it but wasn't going to try to push me to make the NHL, which was a healthy relationship. But then you also, you can always play the devil's advocate here, right? 
did that influence you in the end in a positive way? Because you said you go through that grit, you go through that push. Like, and I mean, working with athletes over the years, do you hear these kind of different stories and how it lines up? And everyone's unique, but they're, to me, I tend to see just from talking to some professional athletes and people who actually are just that much better, they have some sort of you know, chip on their shoulder. They have that grit from sort of an experience in their childhood. Yeah, I think, you know, some do, some don't. I, I think what matters is that you have a source that you're aware of that you can connect to that, that provides you energy or inspiration or, you know, that, that jolt of dopamine at times, you know, the monotony of training for stuff or something along those lines. I think that the best performers know what that is. For some, it's a chip on the shoulder. Um, for some, it might be, you know, something bigger than themselves, you know, commitment to a team or, you know, if you're a professional athlete to your city or your country or that type of thing. Um, but they do know how to tap into a source that allows them to connect quickly to the, at the very core, the reasons why what they do is so important to them. And if you can stay connected to that, my goodness, does it make it much easier to do all the other things that come with the process of becoming great at something that are challenging and that are monotonous and that you know, at times can make us doubt or question or worry or wonder. And I always like to use sort of the visual of a scale. You know, anything you do in this life, there's going to be the stuff that sucks us down, the burdens, the pressures, the, the worries, you know, the, the bad outcomes in, in whatever we do. And so that comes with territory. And if you can stay connected to a, a sense of purpose, again, as to why what you do is, is valuable enough and meaningful enough to bear those shitty things, you're flying, man. And, and I feel in my experience, 20 years, you know, working in performance psychology, the very best performers I've been around, that is something that I would suggest to you that they have. Uh, and they have it at the ready because they're human. You know, they're going to face setbacks. I mean, they're in the performance arena. You know, if, if take a, the sport that you grew up doing, uh, other than hockey, boxing, guess what? There's only one person who gets their arm raised at the end of that thing. So you have a 50-50 chance of success or failure if that's the only way that you would be measuring that so for me there has to be more to it you know i have to i have to know even in the the darkest times why in spite of how i'm feeling there's no question this is what i want to do i can share a story one of my favorite stories uh, along those lines so a friend of mine who i've done some work with um, in the u.s so he's a, a cardiothoracic surgeon so he does heart and lung transplants. So, you know, as you can appreciate, this is that, that stuff that you could be the best in the world and there's still a, a pretty high mortality rate. Um, and so one of the things that, that he talks about is, you know, the way he stays connected to why he does what he does when it matters the most. When he meets with his uh, patients before their surgery, um, he'll ask them, he'll say, look, um, if I do my job well, and you get to leave here, what are you going to do? Like, what is it that you want to do? And it's, there's two parts of this that's fascinating. Number one, they come into the office, as you can appreciate, and, and all that they've been consumed with for weeks and months is death and dying, you know, hoping not to die, hoping to survive. Uh, what they've not been focusing on at all is life and living. So he asked them, if I do my job right and you get to re-engage in your life, what are some things that you want to do? Or what's one th the first thing that comes to your mind? And he says, it's powerful because in that moment, they just kind of, they relax a bit, right? And he says, no one ever wants to, you know, whatever, climb Mount Everest. It's like they want to take their wife of 40 years for an ice cream cone and, and they want to watch their, their kids compete in little league soccer. It's the simple joys. So he says, okay, great. He says, you put all your energy there. He says, but the trade-off is if I do my job well and you get to do that thing, send me a picture. So now let's flash forward to any moment in his life on any given day, you know, where he's been up for 30 hours and had really intensive surgeries and, you know, he's facing a stack of papers and just soul-sucking administrative stuff. And you find yourself in those moments going, you know, why the fuck am I doing this? Like, really, why do I, you know, we always, we ask those questions to ourselves. And the difference between him, who I would consider one of the most impressive performers and persons I've ever met, he has a very strong answer to that question. And not only does he have an answer, I said to you, it's not enough to have the answer. Can you stay connected to it or quickly connect? 
he shifts his, literally pivots his desk. He has a separate laptop. And on this laptop is a running slideshow of all of these images over a 40 year career of people whose lives he's saved for, for lack of better description. There's, you know, tears of joy at birthday parties or whatever, bar mitzvahs or wedding anniversaries or, you know, and people are sending the picture. There's the two lovers of 50 years having the ice cream cone. And like, I'm getting goosebumps sharing this story. And in that moment, the freaking rocket booster uh, a pack of dopamine that goes through his veins instantaneously the balance of those scales shifts and it's like yes i still have the same burdens and pressures and stack of shit i don't want to do but now there's less resistance now i see that as something that comes with the experience that i'm really here to do to help people to make a difference to save lives to, to see people return to life and living, to, to see grandkids get the grandparents back and, and all the rest. It's like, this is why it's so important to be driven and motivated by that. And that's what the best performers I've been around are connected to. That is amazing. That's a beautiful story. When you were uh, describing it and you started to say, as soon as he asked him, what do you want to do? It was like, oh, okay, I know where you're going with this. And that's I've never heard of a doctor doing that. That's beautiful. I think that's an incredible way to do it. And, you know, what's really got me curious here, because you've talked about this before to me, and I think it is so important. Like, I've known my why for a long time. And, you know, for me, it's always been about, um, you know, doing my parents proud. Like, that's a very powerful like and you like you even said too, staying connected that's a whole nother level that people will be like oh yeah this is my motivation but do you stay connected how do you like to me this is a very puzzling thing for someone who's trying to motivate people trying to get people accountable to themselves trying to make them understand their why because a lot of the time people don't want to peel back that layer like why is it because if you're going to tell me it's to be fit that's not enough. If you're going to tell me it's to be healthy, what you're worried about 20 years down the line, like you kind of think it is, but that as, as humans, we are worried about the next couple days as animals, right? And the concept of 30, 40 years is not really on our front door. Like, how do you find a good way to get people to find their why and then to stay that connectedness to it? I mean, the thing that I can do uh, in my role is be the facilitator, you know, is to ask the right questions such that they may come to understand themselves. Because again, I go back to this, for it to be something that we can stay consistent with, that is such a vital piece of it. And, you know, at times where our motivation will, will ebb and flow, whatever. But when you're driven by something that's deeper, like purpose, that can be the great uh, what would you say? It's it's the thing that will allow us most likely in those vulnerable moments to make the choice or take the action that is versus is not aligned with the thing that we've said is important to us. So my job is to ask the right questions. And part of asking the right questions is trying to help them see for themselves what currently gets in the way of whatever it is that they're looking to create or achieve. Kind of the four questions I would ask anybody and in, in say an initial contact, you know, someone decides they want to, you know, uh, do some coaching work with me. What is it, number one, that you're looking to create or change or experience? Um, Because we need a vision, something we can work backwards from that is compelling. This becomes the, the birth, if you will, of figuring out that sense of why. The next thing we need to know is obviously to this point, what is it that's been the major resistance? Because if there was no resistance, my guess is you wouldn't be talking to me because you'd be living (laughs) whatever the things are, you know, you said you want to be uh, experiencing more of. So we need to know what gets in the way. And oftentimes what gets in the way isn't what we think gets in the way. Well, you know, I have no time and I have so many important roles and, you know, I'm low energy because of all of my, my work commitments and cycle. Yeah, so is everybody. So if that's the barrier, if that's what we really think is the barrier, good luck. You're you're not going to push through that. To me, the ultimate barrier, the deeper barrier is the fact that you're allowing those things to be represented in your mind as, and there's nothing I can do because of those things. And as soon as you can pull a few threads on that narrative, now, now you're in business. Now you might open yourself up to go, hmm, maybe there's more power here and influence that I've given myself credit. So again, understanding the barriers, we can work backwards from that. And then when you know what the barriers or the resistance is, it also then stands to reason, 
whatever our sense of purpose that drives us, it has to be stronger than that. Again, that's the basic concept of the scale. So if we know what we want, we know, you know what gets in the way, we then need to know why it's important to us. I saw a podcast the other day. Uh, it was really neat. It was on the psychology of money. One of my clients sent it to me, and it was uh, a Jesse Eitzler. I'm pretty sure I said his name right. He, you know, big influencer guy in, in the U.S., uh, sold a jet company, you know, very successful guy. And he says, you know, I see all these entrepreneurs all the time, you know, posting about wanting to buy, you know, Lamborghinis and, and this and that or whatever, fancy houses. And he says, what's so fascinating to me is deep down, they don't even know why they're doing it. They have no idea why they're putting in all this time and effort and energy. They think it's for that. He says, so I say to them sometimes, okay, if I give you 10 million bucks right now, what would you do? And he says, very rarely does anybody have anything to say. <laughs> initially. So it's clear. They don't even know at a deep level why they're doing it. We think it's for the, you know, the things at the end of the, the tunnel, the Lamborghinis or whatever, but that's not really it. So the reason why we need to know why it's important is, like I said to you, because there will be resistance. There will be setbacks. Life will kick us in the, in the nuts. There's no question about it. So that purpose has to be stronger. And then related to that is just, and what are you willing to work for? Like, are you genuinely willing to do what it takes? I'll give you an example. I have a friend who, who's in the nutrition space as well. And, you know, he'll have clients come to him and say, hey, you know, I'd love to, to you know, have a better nutrition plan or whatever. And he says, okay, great. You know, or would you be willing to spend a day, let's say a Sunday, uh, or most of the day preparing your meals. And he says, it's amazing how many people like they're out at that point, right? So there's this phenomena where oftentimes in life, we want to want something, but we don't want it enough truly to push through our own inner bullshit to actually go and create it. So those four questions are so key, if you ask me. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. I think it's you know, people, it's right in around that second point there that people don't even want to identify the resistance. And, you know, I, I really love how you directly approached the, the busy. And it was my my buddy Ray had said, everyone's busy. Like you, anyone can say that. And, and they're probably at home watching Netflix at the end of the night, right? It's like, and I would also say, are we though? Like, yes, we right. are. But are we so busy that there's not an hour to do something. If your goal was to start to learn a mu musical instrument or, or get in better shape or, you know, become a boxer or whatever, there is. I, I, I work with some of the busiest people, you know, physicians. It, it, my friend likes to say that's the one job where you could literally literally work 24-7 if you could. And, and even they, you know, can find pockets. And the, the way in which they can find more time and energy is to first be open to the fact that maybe that's possible. Because if every single day I have, oh, I wish I could be better shape, have more time with my family, wish, 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 and it ends with, oh, but there's nothing I can do, then you won't do anything. You will not try. You've just resigned yourself. And it's sort of like this slow burn. Um, so, you know, it's very important that we don't obviously allow that to happen. We, we need to know what the hell we're doing here and why. And we need to know that the biggest barrier to start is our belief that there's nothing that we can do. Totally. I, uh, you had mentioned that last time you were on was those, those red flag statements, right? Yes, and yes. and I, I love how you do that because I start to look for it now with clients. And one of the things I really try to translate to clients is like, appreciate first off, every person I work with, I'll just tell them straight up, you're not lazy, you're hardworking, and you're capable of more. Like that is just something right off the bat that everyone needs to understand. It's that their inherent value for where, because if you have a day-to-day -day job, if you're doing things for others, you're not lazy. You're, yeah. you're willing to do things that make you uncomfortable when it's for someone else and you have some part of a, some concept of accountability, right? Like, you know, people will do these nine to five or sorry, even 12 hour days, 10 hour days. And they'll do that because they have this, this um, motivation from that. And this is the whole, the whole intrinsic extrinsic motivation debate, but that tells you right there, extrinsic motivation still works. Right. And sure. just the idea that if you decide to value something, it's going to be important and it'll be a part of that 13 hours. It's no longer 12 It's 13, but you're not going to buy into that inherent value. There, there was an interesting book I read, um, because you had told me to go into the, the whole idea of self-limiting beliefs. 
And uh, I'd have to show you this book. And his whole premise is you can actually break down character traits and how they, you know, all their behavior is around fundamental values that they have for themselves and, yes. and tell someone has the value of training or nutrition or whatever they're doing, unless it's valuable, it's not going to be made time, right? It's, it's, it's basically, it's going to be lost there, right? Yeah. It's like the, the fatal flaw in the process is not the, the, the program that you would provide. It's the human who's executing the program. Um, and so again, and that's the tough part as a coach, that's the thing that you can encourage, but you can't do, you know, unless you're making house calls at every single time someone is faced with a, a, a fork in the road, you know, nutritional choice, where's Ryland? And he swoops in and bats their hand away. Like obviously you're not doing that. And you can't do that because that, that to me is, is not helpful. Um, you know, if you are the only reason that someone, you know, stays consistent with their diet or their training, you know, that's not the most, uh, uh, that's not the most fruitful motivation in terms of sustainability. Um, and, and I would know this from many, many personal coaches like yourself that I've talked to, the proof is in the pudding in that, let's just say that you were to take a two week vacation, right? What are you coming home to? I won't put you on the spot. I'll say what other personal coaches have said. And that is most likely I'm coming home to a bunch of clients. Some maybe did what they, you know, should have air quotes done. Um, but a lot of them probably didn't, you know, because they, you know, again, air quotes need me to be the reason why. And so, you know, I, I'm very upfront about that. I mean, I will, I will be here to support and encourage you, obviously. Um, but the accountability piece has to be yours because that's aligned with the same thing, the purpose and the meaning. If that's strong enough, I'll stay consistent. If what is in, uh, if what they require is me to be there and, and do that, that's not accountability that's good in my estimation. I, I want them to bring that piece. We can talk about the tools, the strategies, work through the difficulties, the ups, the downs, plan it out, have a vision, everything, but you got to show up. And if you can't show up for yourself, how can anybody else like me show up fully for you? I fully agree that the main uh, thing I actually always uh, look at with clients and it, it completely transforms. So I'll fully answer that question pretty honestly. I'd say about 60 to 70% of my clients would do fine, but there is 30 to 40% that are either in a learning process or they're just not accepting of those values. Yeah. And I mean, I'm luckily in the time that online training is pretty normal for personalized uh, clients, right? So with that edge, like they, they got the program, so I took care of that. But even then, a good portion of the people who are successful fall into the responsibility of autonomy, right? And I've told so many people, it's like I could give you a fish or teach you how to fish. And I'll just tell you that if I give you a fish, you're going to eventually fail. You're going to get hungry, right? Yes. Like I, I got off the phone with someone today who was talking about comparing it to one of these diet plans that one of her friends was doing. And it's like, she had to meet, eat this, this one specific way. I'm like, well, that sounds terrible. You know, I, you know, it's, it, it's very much about, I, I believe in educating people. I believe in if you have the tools and then you start to use the tools, you trust the tools and then you're good. I mean, yeah. that's, that's really the fundamental, especially when it comes to this, this style of, uh, you know, lifestyle adjustments and stuff. But even in general, when you're trying to get skill development, mm -hmm. there needs to be a trust with the system, right? You need to believe in the, the process a little bit and will, people will go very much way ahead to that end result, right? And, you know, I, I have this bit of a, um, uh, uh, basically, you've probably seen that, that motivation loop, the Q routine reward kind of thing. Well, I use it for, um, you know, motivation, momentum, inspiration, because people will start off with motivation, they'll come up and they'll, then they'll have some, uh, you know, they'll do the action process of, hey, I'm going to work out and eat healthy, but they don't realize how big this circle is that they set out for themselves. And there's this huge momentum phase that you need to get over. And this could be any skill development, right? Like, I always ask any someone habit or, or behavioral any, change for that matter. Yeah. Yeah, I always ask someone, do you remember what it was like to skate? It's terrible to learn how to skate. And it sucks sucking at something. As kids, we didn't care. We were just sponges. We didn't judge <laughs> ourselves, right? And now as adults, trying to learn a skill and being bad is it's ego shattering. And so I say it's all about micro, you know, wins, right? Make this little momentum. It's like, no, you're not, you yeah, we want you to be in shape down the road. That's fine. 
how many pushups can you do now? Okay, you're going to do 51 next or, you know, 21 next week and then 22, then 23. Then you're actually building that mini momentum the whole way, right? You got to look at these micro cycles because then you can actually appreciate what the process is giving you, right? One of the most, you know, it's, I love what you said there and a powerful illustration uh, of that. So probably about five years or so ago, I can't recall exactly, um, the Terry Fox exhibit came through Winnipeg. Uh, at the museum. And I'm old enough that, you know, I, I was, I remember, seeing, you, know, you know, CBC footage when he was making his run. Uh, and in fact, you know, my mom was going to take my brother and I, you know, and park on the side of the highway if, if and when he rolled through uh, Winnipeg or Manitoba. Obviously he didn't make it to that point, but nevertheless, it was something that, you know, I remember as a kid and then obviously any Canadian, uh, that would be someone on their, their list of the top Canadians that they admire and respect. So it was quite a moving experience to see this exhibit. And, you know, you're walking around the corner and all of a sudden, wow, that there's his, you know, the prosthetic leg that he ran across Canada. And when you look at this thing, you just, you just feel that it, you feel how uncomfortable it would be even just to put that thing on, uh, let alone, you know, running a full marathon every single day in it. So just gives you a, a glimpse into the to the courage of that man and his resilient spirit. But of all the artifacts, the thing that probably inspired, moved me, affected me the most, there was a newspaper article, and you know, written in 1980 when he did his run. And the journalist, the gist of it was that she was meeting uh, Terry at the beginning of the day before he commenced his run. So this is some ungodly time, four o'clock in the morning or something like that. And so she's approaching the van and she notices one of the things she notices right away, it just kind of jumped out at her, the original, you know, Marathon of Hope van, it had two counters on it at all times. Miles, you know, ran and miles still to go. And so as she's approaching the van, she sees these two numbers and both of them look astronomical, right? You know, whatever, 1500 miles completed and 3000 plus, I have no idea how many counties to go. It's like in either case, she's never, she's not doing the running and she's looking at that and going, holy crap. So it inspired her to ask him. She said, you know, Terry, she basically shared, you know, what she felt about that. And she said, so how do you, the guy who has to have run the 1500 and do the other 3000, how do you not get intimidated or overwhelmed by, by the sheer magnitude of this, you know, thing you're shooting for? And he says, easy. He says, I don't look at it at all. He says, I mean, that's the goal, obviously. And, and I'm, I'm working every single day to, to complete it. He says, you want to know what my mind focuses on when I start? He says, simple. That telephone pole right there where we marked off, where our run ended, the only goal I have when I start my run is to get to the next one. And as I'm approaching the next one, I have an inner conversation with myself that says, what do you think, Terry? You got it in you to get to the next one. And as I approach the next one, I have an inner conversation that says, and so on and so on. And eventually he strings enough friggin' telephone poles together that he's done his 26 miles for the day. And so how do we keep from being intimidated by the, the massive goal or the, whatever we're sh shooting for? What you said, let's break that sucker down. You know, that can be accomplished by what I do in the next moment gets me closer to it or further from it. I put in a, an honest effort at my workout, I move closer to. I cut corners and don't do what it should be, I move further from. And it's funny because no one moment you can say is going to be the, okay, I, I skipped that workout and then everything physical fell off from there. No, it's not that extreme. But what happens in those moments is you either reinforce to your deep subconscious that you are someone that when you set your mind to do something, you will do it in spite of you know the obstacles and whatever, or you train yourself that I am someone who will do something to the point of a certain level of resistance and then I fall off and I betray myself. And that is what's earned in those micro moments. And I feel like the performers that can answer the call again and make the right choice in that moment are the ones that go on to achieve the things that they set out to do. And that's no different for, for you or I or anybody else. It's not the domain of, of super athletes or whatever. That's just humans being. 
Yeah, I, I love that story, Terry Fox. I, I, I might have been you that had mentioned it to me, but I definitely have heard that before. Now, I had done a, a marathon a couple of years ago and even like a half recently, and, and especially just last year when I was doing it, that, that's exactly the narrative you need to have. Like, I'm not built like a runner. It's not a p- super pleasurable experience for me. <laughs> but what yeah. was great was just a simple lesson of, okay, my goal is that down the road. And then what I learned was don't think about how you're going to feel on mile 12 or 13. You just, how do you feel right now? You okay? Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's check in the next mile. Miles done. Okay. I'm still doing pretty good. And in like that, that whole concept is so important when it comes to perception of the whole thing. And, you know, especially when you look at like, you know, trying to modify behavior, trying to improve behavior, your your last and last time you came on basically you're just talking about there was those inner dialogues are the important ones it's are you winning or losing this towards the character that you want to create and Mm -hmm. and you had kind of mentioned it's like you know it doesn't matter if you have a cupcake and celery one day it matters for what that decision is going to reflect on your character down the road and you're building your character by each and every moment right And, and I really appreciate that, that value of the, you're the one who really addressed it for me. And, and I always tell people to do it, understand your inner dialogue. Like, don't let it just be, ask it some questions. You know what I mean? And recognize that, again, you want to talk about uh, one of the observations that I have made in my career, which anybody who would look at high performers could come to the same conclusion. The best and most consistent performers do not make tough situations tougher by virtue of what they bring to it. What do I mean by that? So if I'm in the midst of a a grueling workout, okay, it's already freaking grueling. I make the situation worse by constantly reminding myself and torturing myself about how grueling it is, right? So if I could just be more neutral in my thinking there, I take away some of the suffering, but not only that, there's an energy uh, economics there that I reclaim for myself. So to your point earlier, you know, I have another athlete I, I work with, and I don't talk about who I work with, but she, she, she's fine because she's public about it. But So she's a professional triathlete. Her name's Rachel McBride. She's amazing. And a couple of years ago, she qualified for um, the uh, Ironman in uh, Hawaii. The, the, I think it's Kona is the big one. Yeah, Kona. So this is like, the, the, the master's golf equivalent of, of uh, triathlon. This is the big, big event. And the conditions are insane. I mean, you know, you're looking at 90 plus degrees, ridiculous humidity, awful winds. It's just, it's a torture test. And this is nine, nine hours of suffering. And so again, I don't care how fit you are. I don't care how experienced you are your mind is going to take you down some deep rabbit holes under those conditions. And so it was precisely that if, if we're fighting our mind for nine hours, gosh, again, the energy cost, the the loss of concentration, et cetera, it's tremendous. So if we can be really, really good here and now of not allowing that inner dialogue to so effectively consume us, gosh, there is so much performance potential we could extract from that and sort of conserve that we're going to need it, you know, mile or, or, or hour nine, shall we say. Uh, and so, again, it's, it's a matter of just being ready to meet those thoughts. We're going to have them, okay? If I had the ability to say to someone who's going through that, I have the magic formula. Say this, click your heels, and, and your mind will just be zen for, for nine hours. I wish I did. I don't. The truth of the matter is your mind is going to be a freaking minefield of negative thoughts imploring you to stop and quit. It's too hard. It's too hot. It's too windy. It's, and it will not stop. And so again, our, our opportunity is to find the right way to meet those thoughts in such a way that we can compress the amount of time that we stay spinning them. And secondly, reduce if possible, the frequency of them, Uh, but make no mistake, they are coming. And so when I, you know, if we're talking about preparing for something such as that, we start from the vantage point of the mind is going to you know, be torturing us. Let's not pretend otherwise. Oh, let's just be positive. It's like, who's going to be positive at that point? It's very tough to do. And it, it brings me to an important principle that I think is so valuable 
uh, and I always like to give credit. Uh, so this is something I, sometimes you hear a thing that you've always, you know, sort of thought about and done, but then you hear the way someone's phrased and say, like, wow, that's just so good. But well, this is one of those. And, and so the gentleman's name is Trevor Moad. And Trevor, you know, he's a, a mental conditioning coach in the U.S. Uh, very, very prolific guy, you know, works with top NFL players, Russell Wilson and, and these types of guys. And he has this great concept called neutral thinking. And just you can tell by virtue of what it's called, neutral. So it's not necessarily positive. It's not necessarily negative. And you first start to understand the power of neutral thinking when you consider the two opposite poles, positive and negative. Now, again, I like to say, I don't think anybody would put up much of an argument if I was to say that if we had the choice to experience more positive, encouraging thoughts versus negative, I don't think many people would suggest that that's not a good thing. The problem is when we're doing important things that are stressful and require us to dig deep and we're tired and all the rest, it's really hard to genuinely feel positive thoughts. You can say them, saying them is not the same thing as feeling and experiencing them. So if we're, if we're just going through the motions to positive ourselves through a tough stretch, it's gonna be futile, your mind will reject it instantaneously and, and it'll probably inflame even further the negative thoughts. So getting to positive is tough when we're pursuing something that's really challenging and, and what have you. So the other side of that then, the negative thoughts. The important piece there is, is that what his research has found is that negative thoughts are roughly 10 times more powerful in terms of how they capture your, your inner mind's attention, 10 times more powerful than positive thoughts. So what does that mean? It means if we can't inject positive and mean it, there's a far better strategy anyways. If we can reduce the negative, you 10x your circumstances. So it's even better to just cut out the negative bullshit and get to a point of, of neutral than it would be to try and force some positive thoughts that your mind is going to swat like flies. And so the idea of neutral thinking then is what he established. Neutral thinking says, acknowledges what is. You know what? This is a grueling ass triathlon and I got three more hours to go and I want nothing more than to not be doing this right now. <sighs> but neutral thinking says, but I then shift my attention towards what is within my control and influence, which is the next thing that I do, the next behavior, the next action, the next thought, the next sentiment, etc. And in that situation, I have reduced the negative drag, which is also going to free up energy, focus capacity, the things that I could utilize uh, for more uh, performance potential in the moment. And the other thing is, I think when most people hear that, you go, I think I could do that. You know, I think I could challenge myself to at least get to neutral. Neutral something my mind would receive. You know, if I'm trying to feed it all this positive stuff and it feels anything from that, again, it will reject that. But neutral, okay, and you're acknowledging that things are shitty right now? Yes, yes, I did. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. What do we want to do next? Right? And boom, now I've put my, now I'm more here right now. Now I'm more present and present and I can be in control of that next action, whatever it is. I love that neutral thinking. You spoke about it last time and, and it was it was brilliant because I am also more of, I'll be honest, I, I try to just stick to the glass half full perspective and it works for me, but that doesn't necessarily work for everyone. But on top of that, I didn't realize that it wasn't always working for me, right? Well, and, yeah. you know, like just um, just in terms of, well, you had, I, did, I didn't know that number, that 10 times full number, but, you know, having a deliberation in your mind is actually like, you're just, you're going to lose that, right? Because what you had even ma made the point. It's one thing to think a positive thought, but to feel, you can't change that feeling very, like on command. And what I love about emotions, or sorry, about neutrals, it takes the emotion out of it and puts you into the action. And so if you're, if you're good with it, I would love for you to tell that story you told my clients about how you use neutral thinking for your training. Oh, the uh, swing the leg? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So um, uh, my wife and I enjoy working out together. Um, but in, in recent years, just by virtue of primarily my schedule, you know, I'm working evenings, it's all over the map. So it was really difficult to do so. Um, and look, my wife is very self-motivated, make no mistake about it, but it was more getting to the gym in the evening. It's dark. She doesn't like to drive when it's dark. And so 
collectively, my schedule was influencing our ability to train together and then even to some degree hers because, you know, it's, it's better if I could drive. So, you know, we started to think about that and weigh the pros and cons. And I thought, you know, <laughs> there is one solution out there um, that we could consider, and that is to get up really, really early. Um, to work out, you know, if it was important enough for us to do it, because no, I'm not seeing clients at, you know, 525 in the morning type of thing. So we decided to give it a try. And, you know, we've committed to it for I don't even know how long now, well over a year. But I always tell people this, oh, you know, like it must, you're so disciplined in this and that, you know, to get up at 520 in the morning every single day. And I tell them, I fucking hate getting up at 520 in the morning. There is nothing I like about getting up at that time. And every single day, there's that internal tug of war when the alarm goes off, you know, a million strong, legitimate reasons coming through my mind as to why I do not need to leave this, this sanctity of this warm, cozy bed uh, and, and venture off and go work out. And so as my mind is going through that mental tug of war, um, the way that I help it, and this is where the neutral thinking piece gets to be, is, is that I, I control the next action. And the action that I have come to utilize for myself, it's a mantra, but it's, in a, it's a physical action. It's swing the leg. And what does that mean? It means that I can be having that, that you know, million reasons why not to, but if I take the physical action of poking my leg out from under the covers and it makes contact with the floor, my adherence rate is 100%. So I don't have to deny the fact I'm having a moment where I'm not too keen about what I'm about to do, but the behavior and the consistency of the behavior and having something to go to in real time overrides that. And, and of course, like anybody here who doesn't want to go to a workout or whatever, how do we feel when we leave it? You feel great, you know? So I know that I also trust in the fact that what I'm experiencing right now, tired and, and nice and warm, um, I'll, I'll get a better feeling 15 minutes from now, you know, when I'm into it. And, and not only that, that, that sense of not only satisfaction, I would say the sense of pride that you're honoring the person you're trying to become, because I'll have moments in the day where I'll think to myself at the end of the day, I'll forget. It's like, oh man, I'm tired. I don't really want to work out. And I go, oh, I already did. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, so it, it kind of reinforces the behavior that way too. But but that's a great example of neutral thinking. I am being honest with myself in real time about how I'm perceiving the situation. I would way rather sleep beyond 525 than not, but I control the next action. And that next action allows me to stay consistent. Yeah, that's very, very effective. I, uh, I literally flipped uh, one of my clients just from that. I don't even know if you got to watch your whole uh, uh, webinar there, but um, I told him about that whole notion of swing the leg and then checked in with him next week. Yeah, I used it. It works. And I started to use it myself and, and it's just in different places, yes. definitely in the morning when you don't want to get up, but it's the basic principle that when you start to have a deliberation in your mind, which we're super capable of or rational beings that want to rationale our way into an easier life, that's how we have technologies. But to basically quiet the mind and go to action because, you know, in, instead of deliberating when, especially I always say this, if it requires justification, it's probably wrong because you don't need to justify the good choice, right? Mm -hmm. There's no justification, right? Yeah. It's just like, Oh, I had a salad. I, I should have salad because X, Y, Z. No, I didn't need to justify it. It's there. We know, you know, yeah. I didn't need to justify training. I know I should. So, Usually when you get caught up in a discussion with yourself, maybe start leaning in, maybe just start quieting the mind and go towards yeah. action. And like you had said, like it, the, the voices disappear. Like that's the cool thing is as soon as you accept that you, it's not a matter of winning the rational argument, it's just doing the action and all the voices disappear. And, and then you're, you, you stay true to, like you say, the, the character, right? Yeah. And ultimately, uh, regardless of what my mind is thinking in a given moment, which is just so fleeting, uh, the behavior overrides that I do the thing anyways. You know, how many, a lot of people get to the gym and they maybe don't want to do it and it takes 10 minutes before they start to enjoy it. But at that point they're enjoying it. But most importantly, they did not prove that the state that they were in did not interfere with taking the action that they have said to themselves is important. 
And if we say something is important and we don't, you know, take the consistent actions in that direction, our mind is going to be experiencing a whole lot of cognitive dissonance here. You're telling me this is important, but we cannot stay consistent. So again, that's the territory sometimes of people wanting to want the thing that they're striving for, but but maybe don't. And maybe they need to, to pursue something different or dial it back a bit or do something that's more interesting to them, etc. You know, I know a lot of people that pursue goals for the wrong reasons and, and they wonder why they're unsuccessful. And then the more that they're unsuccessful, again, that spirals into this general sense of I'm not someone who can commit to something and stick with it, you know, and that factors into other areas of their life. Totally. Yeah. I, it's the, the, the inner narrative of who you kind of set out to be. I want to take one step back because this was a really cool uh, question to ask you because, you know, I've known you on a more professional level, but you know, you told me a bit of your history and I'm very fascinated with the development that people have. What are some big moments for you, whether it's growing up or in your career, that really changed your perception? Some key, maybe two or three key moments that, that you felt like, whether it be professional or just as a performance psychologist, that kind of influenced you? You know, it's, it's a very good question. I don't know if I have a um, specific key moment. I probably do. Um, but I would say, generally speaking, it's the moments, you know, where the adversity came. Um, because, you know, on one hand, I think that's something that we all struggle with. We, we don't want to be unsuccessful or hit roadblocks or fail or any of that stuff. Nobody wants that. Um, but, of course, it's not just a cliche. There's, that's where the most rich learning oftentimes comes from. Um, and so I think for me, life does a great job of providing you opportunities to experience adversity in big and small ways. And I'm grateful that it you know, at an early point in my life, partly through sports, partly through, you know, life events and, and things that have occurred to me, I've developed a pretty good process, if you will, for, for dealing with that. Um, and you just think of how important that is, because if you, if you can have a perspective on adversity that's, that's, A, allows you to navigate through it, not only and stay healthy and whole, but to improve or become better or enhanced from it in some way, that's massive. Um, and number two, like I said to you, it's coming. Um, and if we don't have a strategy to deal with it, you, you suffer enough adversities, it can really erode the, the sense of self that you have or the sense of belief in your, your possibilities and, and, and your ability to rate, r- overcome your circumstances, whatever they might, might be. So for me in general, it was moments of adversity. And I think of, you know, what else did that do for me? It forces you to learn how to adapt um, it humbles you to the point where, you know, you recognize maybe at times I need some help and need to get some assistance or, you know, some, some people have some expertise in a certain area to improve myself. So for me, I think by and large, it's in general, just the experience of, of setbacks and tough times, learning how to be uh, effective at navigating through and then taking it to the next level. Once, once you have that, I think projecting that sense forward in in that you know I've, I've had conversations with you Ryan I, mean, I, I really admire stoic philosophy and, and the great stoics would say look if if there's something you can anticipate in your life that could happen and if it happened man it would bring you to your knees or it would make it very difficult um, for you to to find a sense of stable ground in the moment let's say it stands to reason that we should probably consider what we would do in that set of circumstances before it happens. So, you know, it's the idea of anticipating future events that could happen. And if they were to happen, could really take me back and then say, Woof, you know, I don't feel entirely free there. You know, if that was to happen, gosh, I don't know if I could be fully myself. So let's, let's sort of deconstruct that and figure out, you know, what's the first thing I could do? What are the thoughts that would help? Who are the people that I could call if, if that was a possibility? What are some of the, the actions that I could take in that moment? The more that we begin to work backwards from those things that scare us and see ourselves responding under those conditions, guess what? We have less anticipatory anxiety about them, more peace of mind, and obviously more confidence if they were to occur. So I think the actual experience of, of adversity, obviously, developing a healthy process to, to work through that, paired with pushing myself to put myself in challenging situations 
um, that maybe I haven't even been in to, to make sure that if I was, I'm triggering, if you will, an adaptive response. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good systematic approach. I, I really like that. And, you know, I think you probably see this and, and I certainly do is, um, you know, there's there's this character trait of perseverance or belief in perseverance, you know, that I think some people have and other people just don't really experience. They don't realize that they're capable of adversity. They're capable of when a tragedy or some sort of life event happens, well, where's the positive? Because there is a silver lining. You know, I, I feel like it's been a superpower of mine that, um, you know, from being a goalie, I, I, and I played on teams that weren't very good. Uh, so I was going to get peppered with shots. Sure. You better believe that when the goal went in and I didn't want it to, I wasn't thinking about that. The moment that puck went in, I cleared my net and I said, bring another one because that's my lifestyle principle now. And it allows me to like in a moment of tragedy, in the moment when the game is losing, I still care about just existing in that moment. But well, you can be fully. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can be fully, by extension, what we're saying is, so there's very minimal internal distraction. And the internal distraction would otherwise be the thing that could manifest as a lapse in concentration, uh, tense muscle, meaning you don't react as naturally as you would, let's say, to a glove save or whatever the case might be. Um, so I agree with you. That's a superpower. You know, obviously, we know a lot of the same uh, athletes in combat sports that, that we work with and you've competed with and against. Uh, and it's the same thing. I tell them that. I mean, if you, the person who can be as fully present as possible for the most amount of moments in a fight, gosh, I sure like their chances. You know, it's yeah. when we, it's when we get in the way of ourself that things get much more difficult. And especially in, let's say, a performance arena like that, that's a read and react type of thing. You know, ideally, we want zero distraction, absolute full focus available to just interpret in real time what's coming at you. I mean, there's that famous scene in um, the first Matrix movie um, where Keanu Reeves is just beginning to, to appreciate his newfound powers. And the nemesis, I think it's uh, Mr. Smith is, is the fictional yeah. character, you know, is doing all this crazy punching and this and that. And, and Keanu Reeves is just like, you know, effortlessly with one <laughs> arm blocking everything, you know, it's, that's what, I mean, that's high level, but, but that illustrates what we're saying here. I mean, he is just so, uh, um, what would you say? He is so present fully that it's just reading and reacting. And, and because he's in that state, all of his physical and technical abilities are just free to come out to the fullest of their potential. And so that's ultimately what we're after, because that's the only thing that we can actually influence or control. Um, I could put myself in that state, jump into a boxing ring, which I have no business jumping into. Um, and if I was able to channel the best of my ability and be in that state, but was fighting, you know, someone who's better, I'm not going to win, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but that's not the point. It said that this is what was available for me to do. Uh, because think of it conversely, how many times all of us in our lives have we been in competitions or, or it doesn't have to be a competition. You know, you're, you're in sales and it's the sales pitch that, gosh, we feel so anxious about or, you know, something along those lines. And we get in those moments and we leave that performance moment. We go, damn it. Like there was a better performance there that had nothing to do with my skill or ability it had everything to do with, I, I wasn't in the right space. You know, I was too amped up. I was too distracted. That's the piece that we're trying to minimize. Um, I can't, I can't get better than I am in the performance moment, but I can certainly get worse than I am by virtue of what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, etc. So again, you know, neutral thinking, if I can decrease the negative effect of that, by extension, I unleash more of my potential. Because if I am distracted internally, thoughts, feelings, pressures, burdens, you know, worrying about outcomes, I'm shrinking some of my available performance potential down. As I said, your focus will narrow, we're overthinking, we're overanalyzing, et cetera. And in that moment, that might be the difference between slipping and not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can, uh, I can think very, I mean, again, I was a goalie and then going into boxing, two sports that 
will make an individual really focus on themselves. And that those mo- both moments happen. Sometimes, you know, you're in that uh, beautiful zone. And then the other times where it's like, I don't know who I am. And I think that's the real big discussion that you end up having is mm-hmm. like, you're not aware of your identity in that moment. You're too fixed on worrying about your identity. And then you're not being your identity, right? It's like, you know, yes. it's, it's basically like being in a conversation with someone and you're worried about what they think about you too much. So mm-hmm. then you're, you're going to act nervous. You're going to be anxious. And yes. so... But, you know, uh, you'd be fascinated with my friend Ray Lavoie, who was the first guest on here. He actually does the research of flow, flow state. And they are actually uh, starting to come out with brand new papers. And they're narrowing it down because I think it's, I can't remember, enunciate his name, but that, yeah. So he was the first guy, but he had like 12 things, like a whole bunch of different qualitative, not quantitative measures. And so they're narrowing it down to, I'm pretty sure one of them for sure is fluency. And I think the other is focus or it could be something else. I, I forget the second quality, but they're now starting to actually measure it and understand how people have these micro flow, flow states and, and even bigger flow states, which I think is really cool. Really like, you know, it, it'd be really fascinating if we can start narrowing down what, what they're even going to the physiological level where heart rate and respiratory rate coordinate with two different parts of the flow state, which is really cool. That is cool. I mean, I, whenever I talk about flow, people want, it's, it's kind of, Hey, you know, how can I get into flow more? And I say, well, it's not, it's not exactly like a, okay, step-by-step type of thing. Having mm-hmm. said that, there are component parts of, of what needs to be in place to have the experience or near experience of a flow state. Uh, one of said components that we've been talking about is our attentional orientation. You know, if much of our uh, attention and focus is available and on the task or the environment, the thing that we're doing, Um, then we can achieve that state more readily. What disrupts flow more often than not is the shift from being sort of aware of my surroundings to then being self-conscious. Oh, here comes the negative thought or the negative emotion pops up. And in that moment, my attention shifts from external to internal. And that disrupted that beautiful sense of complete immersion, which was hinging on my attention being more external. So again, you look at those things and you go, okay, is there something we can do to be better at either uh, avoiding the distractions that can occur within? Yeah, sure, there is. I think much more doable is how quickly when the distractions come, can I dissipate those and sort of get more uh, 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 re-engaged, if you will, in the present moment? Uh, Because our attention is shifting back and forth hundreds of times. You know, you think about it in the fight, everything's good, everything's good, and all of a sudden it's not. Holy shit. And I, you know, take a hard hit and I'm starting to wonder, oh my God, that's going to cost me, that's going to score for, for him or her, etc. In that moment, the focus is on me, which was your point, Ryland, and I am not in a state of flow. Now, there's other things that are, are equally important. Um, you know, you can't get in a state of flow if you aren't good at the thing, <laughs> okay? Like, there's an aspect of being in flow that suggests that, that it's almost automatic. Like the behaviors, the patterns are so well rehearsed. It, there's an automaticity. Why is that important? If it's not automatic, I have to consciously think about doing the skill or executing the task. If I'm consciously thinking about that, I'm focused on something that is internal. I'm not, again, present in the environment. So people who are really good at the thing don't have to think about executing it they can just do it Um, and if we're good at it that increases confidence confidence is a key part of flow Um, if you're not confident in the thing that you're setting out to do it's going to be really tough to stay entirely focused in the present moment because i will be judging myself critiquing myself etc but again you see all of these things as elements that someone can work on to be better at can we work to become more confident in ourself and trust in our abilities and our processes absolutely can we work at being more effective at either, again, protecting our focus and or quickly getting it back in the moment? Absolutely. Can we work at becoming better at the thing we do? Well, absolutely, obviously. So we can work on the component parts. And then there is there is a little bit of an element of just, and, and hopefully it, it comes together. Uh, because as I said to you, it's not a conscious thing to say, okay, and now as part of my 
pre-performance routine or pre-sales pitch routine. I will get in the state of flow. It doesn't work that way. The fact you're thinking about it suggests that you're not in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's you the said lack of thought, right? Do the things that you can trust and then allow yourself to just perform. And recognize it again, it's not going to be some linear thing. We're going to have moments where we get kicked in and out of it if we're lucky uh, and can get back in. Do your best to shrink the amount of time that you spend otherwise uh, consumed and distracted internally. Yeah, totally. It's uh, it, it's the it's the ultimate state, and it's it's really interesting. All, all those tips are very important, and I think it's such a valuable thing for athletes and but people in life, right? Like, I mean, you're going to have challenges that you're going to require it. So, I think that's very valuable. I have uh, one question one of my clients sent in, and then uh, you know anyone else here join in, Alec or Sylvia, you guys can drop in the chat box. But it was actually just in, and I was going to ask you there's more about the confidence how do you how do you take recommend someone take criticism to to really remain confident you know like you know an athlete who's trying to learn boxing how to not get in your own head and and we had just talked about how you're so concerned about yourself but they're trying to coach you right sure. you know how, how do you help someone kind of guide their internal dialogue so it's not too self-critical but you know constructive right there's two things in the role of the coach i can be very clear to them what my intention is of the feedback. So if they then choose to perceive it as being extra critical or what have you, that's a them issue to resolve. That There's no miscommunication from, from you as the coach. You've said clearly. So now we go back to if they do perceive it as overly critical or what have you, that's a them issue. What is it the source of that? You know, Are they accustomed to being overly critical of themselves? If we are accustomed to being overly critical of ourselves. What do you think the odds are in any given practice moment or performance moment that we are not just going to be overly critical of ourselves? And if it's balanced, you're okay, but oftentimes it's not. So take, for example, uh, this happens all the time in medicine. Let's say you have a, a, a physician who, a surgeon. So they do a surgery and, you know, 97% of that surgery went at least to standard, if not exceedingly done well. And a lot of times you'll see people totally disregard the 97% and obsessively focus on the 3% of, of the surgical procedure that could have or should have or, or would have been better if X, Y, Z. Now, on the one hand, do I want people to not own that part? Of course not. Like if there's a, a, an element of what happened that we can improve on, you know, we have an opportunity and in some cases an obligation to do so. But let's not dismiss the 97% of things that went well. So part of it is just encouraging people, look, you're going to own the stuff that you're critical about, but are you allowing some equal airtime to the stuff that you're doing well? Because if we believe that confidence and trust is important, but the only information we're ever feeding ourselves is all the reasons why we weren't good enough or ready enough for this practice session or performance or what have you, how the hell do you get there? You're not allowing any of that to even register. And here's the crazy part. When you think of the ratio, it should be the reverse. More often than not, there's far more things that we can point to in any given performance if we're good and consistent in what we do that went well. We're not allowing that. Did I, I think I did I share the Troy Aikman story on your podcast? No? That so Troy Aikman, a very famous quarterback. Uh, in the National Football League in the 1990s, Hall of Famer, played for the Dallas Cowboys. I forget which year it was. Let's say 1991. Uh, Dallas won the Super Bowl, the, you know, the, the biggest event in their sport. And so obviously there's, there's pressure to repeat as champions, which is kind of silly because pff, it's such a ridiculously difficult thing to do in pro sports. But nevertheless, that's, that's, that's the target that we place on on teams that win the championship. So the next season goes on and they do, they do well, obviously, but, but not, they're not the, as fine a tuned machine, it seems as they were the, the year before. So they make it to the playoffs and they get through and lo and behold, they get back in the Super Bowl and they win the Super Bowl. And this was like, I was a teenager at this time in my life. So this was not me looking at this through, you know, per mental performance coach lens. I'm just looking at it as, as a fan of football. 
And I'll never forget to this day. So they're in the, the winner's locker room, the champagne, the hugs, everybody, you know, we're, we are the champions is playing or whatever. And they get to Troy, who's the quarterback, just won the Super Bowl back to back. And he's probably the MVP, I would guess. Most often the quarterback is. And they go to interview him and you'd swear that he was the losing quarterback. He just looked like, like this, like dead as a doornail to the point where the interviewer even made notice of it, just something to the effect, like, Troy, wow, you, you know, for someone who's just won back-to-back -back championship, you don't, you don't look too thrilled about it. And he took a deep breath and exhale, and he says, I'll tell you what, he says, this was a hard year for me. He says, because my kind of my mentality that I fell into was if we won our games in the regular season, I was relieved, but if we lost them, I was devastated. And so again, he did, he basically excluded any opportunity for his mind to pick up on all the signs that would suggest, but we're also doing pretty good. You know, we're winning games and I threw a bunch of touchdowns and our offense is coming around, et cetera, et cetera. It was just so binary for him. You know, if we lose, everything's, everything is, is devastating. And if we win, thank God, really? Like, where's the excitement? Where's the inspiration? So I've never forgot about that. And it's just sort of a, a, a cautionary tale. Look, I'm all for being critical of oneself with a view to make improvements. Because I work with performers too who say, oh yeah, like I am, I'm hard on myself, but you know, I have a process that works. Okay, tell me your process. Well, you know, I leave the performance moment, whatever it is, sales, sport, surgery, doesn't matter. And uh, I go home and I, I beat myself up incessantly uh, and, and I go to sleep. And it's like, that is not a reflective process. That is a rumination process. That is going to ensure that you show up the next day a little bit less excited about what you do, a little bit more anxious about what you do, a little less confidence, because again, what is it that I'm feeding my mind? Uh, only the negative stuff. So I'm not about being, hey, just be positive, but can we be balanced in what we say? And if we're feeling the pressure or if we're in a habit of, of being extra critical, how reliable do you think our perception is of any given moment, any given performance moment? If we have a default position where we're looking for the reasons why we weren't good enough, or et cetera, I'm not going to trust my judgment all that much under those sets of conditions. So I need to force myself to do a few things. And I like the idea of a, of a reflective practice at the end of whatever performance thing that you do. Ask yourself, okay, what went well? And I, I start with that. Why? Not because, hey, start with a positive, but because most people will dismiss it altogether. So force yourself to at least start there. You know, the team responded great. You know, I pushed through some exhaustion when I didn't want to work out. Like there's a lot of things we can point to, legitimate things. And as my mind is hearing those things, it's like, you know, it's building the confidence. It's building the trust. And then now that I've spiked my confidence and trust, with 50 jolts of dopamine, now I'm in a much better state to say, okay, and how can I be even better? If I start with a negative, it's like, oh, you know, I'm beating myself up. I was terrible here and this was awful. I'm never going to make to the level I want to get because hang on a sec. <laughs> you know, in spite of all that, there was a lot of good things. So the three questions, you know, what, what went well, what obviously can I improve upon for next time? And how do I apply that? It's not enough to say it What's the action step that I can take to ensure that I'm, I'm honoring this experience and, and drawing the lessons and using them to be better in the same uh, set of conditions next time? I love that. What went well? What can you do better and how to do it? I always tell people uh, building confidence is a matter of building a wall. You, you have to do it brick by brick. And you can't forget that you just laid a brick down and you have more to go. You know, it's, it's, it's a very slow control process and there's always going to be room to grow on your wall, but you can't forget the brick that's been laid down in front of you that the work that you've already done, like do not forget what you've done because you leverage that for the very next brick. Right. Yeah. And you draw on that to establish confidence and trust. And, you know, which brings up another thing that I think is important is, I'm, I'm much uh, more a fan of people anchoring to trust than confidence. And this is a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Kelly Dell, who likes to distinguish the difference. The difference is this. If we go to confidence, think about what confidence feels like. Confidence usually feels like I'm, I'm as confident as my last good 
or bad performance in, again, whatever we do. That could be in sport, in business. It could be interacting with a loved one. Like if I'm going off confidence and I did something nine times in a row that was, was really good and I did the 10th or 11th, sorry, the 11th time, it wasn't so great. What happens to confidence, right? Like it dips. Whereas trust says, I'll tell you what, I trust enough in myself, my abilities, my processes, my inner strengths, the way to work through challenges and setbacks. I trust enough in that, that even if I faced a performance moment that wasn't my best, I trust I'm not going to allow that to, to determine my level of confidence in my abilities or my prospects or where I can go from here. There's an aspect that says, if you're in the arena enough times, we're going to have those moments where it's not always going to go well. Trust makes room for that. Trust views rather the 10 instances before that that went well and privileges that versus the one where it didn't go as well. Trust says, I'm doing just fine. How do I know? Because 10 out of 11 times, I'm able to do things to a very high standard. That's why I like trust. We're going to make mistakes. We're not going to win all the time. We're going to face all types of setbacks and errors and all the rest. If I'm working from a place of trust, I will not allow my confidence to become eroded in those moments when they occur. And I think that's a big uh, a shift that people should really try and make for themselves. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. You know, just the the idea of confidence is such an intangible, it's such a theoretical and, and really uh, uh, an opinionated concept. It's like, uh, I always tell people, what's the difference between confident and cocky? Do you believe them? Like that's, that's really what I think one of the fundamental principles are because when you, when you, you know, all oh, that person's confident, oh, that guy's cocky. And, and sometimes I know the individual that they're talking about who's cocky. So I think he's confident because I know what he's capable of. Yeah. And then, but if you, you completely change this whole narrative on yourself is just like you say that, that trust is like, don't forget what you've done. And, and, you know, there's going to be room for error within trust. Like it's okay if it, you know, it's, you know, you're not going to be hundred percent, but you have a right to trust yourself. So I think that's very valuable. I think that's a good perspective. Earlier, if, if you're anchoring to that and, and then you work backwards, then I'm already going to, going to be at least oriented to recognize if the toughest days come in whatever it is that one does, if I'm anchored to trust, I will know that in spite of that, I'll be able to persevere and get through. You know what else helps us persevere and get through? Let's go back to the first thing we talked about. Is your sense of purpose and meaning and why you do what you do stronger than the toughest day? If it is, I'll persevere. So these three, three things spiral into each other. If the purpose is stronger than the burdens and the obstacles, I'm going to persevere and thrive. If I can stay connected to that purpose, that's even better still. And as I work down the line, if I can trust more in myself and my processes, that you put me in enough situations, I'm going to perform exceedingly well, but I cannot immunize myself from being a human, which means I'm still susceptible to setbacks and errors and, and all the rest. So when those occur, do I trust enough in myself that I'm strong enough to push through that and continue on my journey? And if I can say that that's a solid yes, then guess what that does to the fear of those moments? It dissipates. The thing that we're most afraid of, if we know that that wouldn't be enough to stop us from pursuing it, guess what happens to the level of that fear? It dips exponentially. That's, that's really powerful. I, I'm, I'm going to use that a lot, that trust. I, I think that's a great lesson. That's something I learned. So I've uh, taken up a lot of your time here. I could talk to you all day, but uh, why don't we finish off with uh, the, the, the routine here? What is, uh, is this is the Strong Ambition Podcast. What is your current ambition? What are you driving into right now? You know, this is going to sound cliche, um, but it's just a continuous project of myself, I guess. Um, and I don't mean that in an ego sense, but, you know, for, for what I want to do to be the, the best support I can for the people that I get the privilege to, to work with, it stands to reason that if I can develop myself to the fullest of my ability, that's the way that I can best achieve that. Um, so that gets me excited every single day. I'm, I'm human like everybody. I have all the same barriers, the pressures, the burdens, the insecurities, all of that stuff. Um, and so every single day, trying to be a little bit better version of myself, because I see that as bringing more value to the world and to the people I work with. And, 
getting the chance to work with people who are committed to, you know, transforming themselves in fundamental ways. It's just such an exciting thing to be a part of. Um, and it's not something I ever take for granted. So that's the other piece of it, you know, that, that humility part that says, you know, I have a job that, that you better take it seriously because when you're sitting across from someone, whether it's what I do or a personal trainer or what have you, you know, they deserve the best. And so if I can look myself in the mirror every single day, knowing that I've brought that, that's what I'm most interested to work on. And that doesn't end in my work. That's as a husband, as a friend, as whatever it can be. There's this awesome video. I've sent it to so many performers. Um, the Snoop Dogg video where he's um, he's accepting his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Have you seen? She's smiling. She's seen it. So he uh, he says, uh, so he's obviously thanked all, you know, whatever, family, friend. But it gets to this point and he says, and then finally he says, I want to thank me. And he pauses and he says, I want to thank me for never giving up hope. I want to thank me for, for no days off. I want to thank me for, for digging deep and doing it for the right reasons and trying to be a good impact in the world. It's like, yes, <laughs> yes. We should all thank me, you, that is us, uh, with a greater sense of, of, of you know, appreciation. You know, because if we're doing the work and earning you know, every single day the right to, to feel and become what we want to, your damn rights we should. And again, what does that do in terms of just reminding us to feel confident and trust in ourselves? So the continuous project of me, which allows me to have a greater impact, uh, is what I'm most ambitious about. I love it. That's uh, that's exactly what I hope everyone really should be looking at. And uh, you know, I mean, for myself personally, that's that's the real mission in life, right? Is how can you continue to make an impact in the world, right? So I I appreciate that so much. This 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 hour and, and a bit flew by. I'm gonna have to have you on again soon because you know we can chat all day about uh, mindset stuff, and and it only helps uh, my clients and listeners so much. So. Thank you so much, Jason. Why don't you uh, let everyone know uh, where they can find you if you have a, a, you know, whether it's Instagram or if you have a website or anything, just plug your stuff. Yeah, probably the best thing right now is, is just through, in, uh, sorry, yeah, Instagram I'm on. I'm not overly active there, but it's at Dr. J Bro, uh, at D-R period J-B-R-O. Um, and then probably the best one is through LinkedIn. You know, you can access me most readily there. Uh, just my name, obviously, Jason Brooks. Perfect. All right. Well, if anyone is looking for, uh, you know, performance psychologists in any realm and they're in it for the right reasons, this is a guy to go to. So <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks again for your time, Jason. And uh, you have a great weekend. You too. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Jason Brooks, for joining. That was so good. I'm so lucky to have him on the podcast. What great information he has there. New, neutral thinking, understanding that it's about the action you take in order to outweigh those negative thoughts and internal trust. I really love that understanding of how we got to build up our trust, not our confidence, but our trust within ourselves. So I hope you learned a lot today and took a lot from this episode. And thank you for joining today. Please remember to like, subscribe, leave a review. And uh, don't forget to head to rqtrainingnutrition.com because on that website, I have a NEM forum. I talk about nutrition, exercise, and mindset. You better believe mindset. And this last uh, blog I have is about internal belief. It's about how you believe in yourself and how we lose our ability to believe. So make sure you check out that website. Thank you again for joining. And remember, it's about the, it's not about the pursuit of happiness, but it's the happiness within the pursuit.